Time for pain! So, uh, you know how at the end of the last video I did, I said I was working on a separate video project? You know, the one that I said was like teabagging a cactus? Well, this is that project. Or, at least, uh, part of it. I've been working to get the footage for this for the better part of like two months or so, and yeah, I finally got enough for part one, so time to show you what I've been working on. Oh, and by the by, the Tinocon highlights video is coming. It's just a lot more work than I was expecting. But anyways, sit down, children, because today I'm gonna learn you how to YouTube. There comes a time in every content creator's life that you just say, to hell with it. I'm just gonna take a format that a more popular and better creator has used and use it for my own personal gain. And you see, this is rule number 76 on content creation. You can remember it with this catchy and memorable phrase. When in doubt, find someone's work to copy and then just label it under the pretense that you were inspired by their content and then bring it up in the video as a joke to seem self-aware. Where. What I'm getting at is, I am wholeheartedly ripping off creators like Mitten Squad here with his challenge run series for this video, but you know, what can I say? It's a great format. Anyways, Warframe is a game about choice. There's easily over 300 weapons. There's over 40 frames, and there's probably more cosmetic options than either of those put together. But some tools are better than others. Even in a game about power fantasy, there are still weapons that serve you about as well as using a toilet scrub. And so, I asked the age-old question. Is it possible to beat Warframe's star chart with only a stug? First, let's lay down some ground rules. Rule number one. The challenge is to complete all 250 plus notes of the star chart using only the stug, excluding areas in which its usage is impossible. And in order to keep things simple, the challenge will be considered a success if I can obtain a star chart completion with all of my kills being attributed to the stug. We can see this on the stat screen here. This does open up some purposeful loopholes in the challenge, and you'll see why this was necessary soon. Rule number two. The only weapon I am allowed to use is the stug. I am also restricting myself on certain ability usage. I will not be using any abilities that damage enemies, even if minor, and I will not be using crowd control powers either. Abilities that do not violate those two rules, however, are fair game. Rule number three. Platinum was a bit iffy, but I ultimately decided to not allow myself to purchase any, though the starter platinum, however, is okay, as well as trading for platinum if I'm able to. And lastly, rule number four. I will not be clearing nodes with parties unless it is absolutely necessary. Everything will be done solo otherwise. The run is also being done on a fresh account in order to make sure that my stats are accurate and also to make sure I don't accidentally skip any nodes or miss any junction requirements. This also means that you can view my account on the PC version for yourself to validate that I did not cheat. You can simply type slash profile and then the player name to check. We begin our journey as we see two alpha males compete for some bitch boy stuck in a refrigerator. The weaker male receives an electric titty twister from his better and to the victor go the spoiler. We listen to Rebecca as War plugs his anus key into some strange device. Afterwards, we get to choose our starting frame. For this run, I opted to start with Volt. Because I am not allowing myself to use crowd control or damage powers, Excalibur is more or less useless to me. And Mag really doesn't fare much better. Volt, however, has access to a good defense power in the form of his electric shields, and his passive can be handy in giving our early game Stug a much needed boost in damage, so I chose him. Meanwhile, Vor is successful in gaining access to the legendary moon refrigerator. And out comes the aforementioned frozen stubby boy bitch, aka me, the newest Tenno. My name, I'm Stug in Hell. And while most Tenno awaken to a life of fun, lighthearted murder, ours is a path of torture and misery. Vor, reveling in his fetish for pet play, and apparently having forgotten that necks are the proper place to put collars, instead sticks one onto my leg. Then he remembers that he forgot to bring the leash and decides to leave. Clearly, he has not dabbled in this for very long. Rebecca, sir, is my power systems, making me wonder why she didn't do this before. I'm made aware just how terrible the starting sensitivity is, and adjust it to be more befitting to a god gamer such as myself, and we run into our first major roadblock. The game wants you to kill these mooks before you can leave the freezer. And, just in case you haven't noticed by now, I don't have a stug yet. But I cannot progress until these enemies are dealt with. I tried for quite some time to find a gap in the geometry or some way to get these grenier to off themselves. 
I tried waiting around for a good long while as well, but nothing worked. At this point, we need to invoke a rule loophole, which is something I mentioned earlier. The success condition we're using for this run is the kill stat in our profile page. If this number does not rise from something other than a stug, we are in the clear. In other words, we don't need to not kill these Grenier, we simply need to kill them in such a way that the game does not recognize them as our kills. It is at this point, I would like to introduce you to a friend that we will be seeing a lot of the bullet jump. See, actions like bullet jumps and jump slides have hitboxes that do damage to nearby enemies. However, if an enemy is killed by one of these actions, it is not counted as a kill for you for some reason. Why? I haven't the slightest clue, but it's the only reason that this run is at all possible. It's not just these two actions either. There's actually a number of ways to kill enemies without the game deciding that you killed them, but we do not have access to those methods yet, and we will likely never use them. Perhaps one day, if D does not fix them, I will do a pseudo-pacifist run of the star chart, opting to get zero kills following this same rule set. Anyway, I handle the enemies with the bullet jump strategy, and I continue on my way. The game then insults me by offering me a melee weapon. I try to ignore it, but it's clear that DE does not want me going around killing enemies with my feet. Joke's on them though, because I'm going to be using the Skana to clip my toenails. I'm then offered a secondary weapon, to which I decide to grab the Lado, figuring that if I accidentally shot it, it would be the most likely to not kill something on accident. I then use my feet to loot whatever I can from a hallway. Vor then pisses on my goddamn ship like Robotnik pissed on the moon. Then he turns to aim at me. Rebecca tries to get me to cut the stream, but I say no thanks. If you have to rely on a sword to avoid Vor's liquid gold, you're in very big trouble. I load some more lockers, am offered yet another weapon that is not a stug, much to my dismay, hear a new tutorial line from Rebecca involving the Parazon, and summon the ship. I learn that you don't actually have to defend anything during this segment, and can instead just twiddle your thumbs. The ship then reveals a hole. It is my hole. It was made for me, so I jump in. I am then greeted by a man that I I have never seen in my life at this point in our journey, who then gives me a neural sensor. Then, I regret boarding the ship as we are introduced to the only character annoying enough to have their own volume slider. I check my stats to make sure no kills are registered in the tutorial, and luckily there are none, and we're free to continue. I plug some things into some other things, am given a mission to acquire a communications module, and set off on my way. Daddy Vor talks about how cool my leg bracelet is, as I do my first spy mission. I should also point out, by the way, I will not be taking you through every mission and node that I do. Otherwise, we'd be here so long that I would have released two videos by the end. That is a very, very long time. I return to the ship, plug a battery into the microtransaction console, and take a look at my future weapon. Unfortunately, the Stug is locked as a Mastery Rank 2 weapon, and for a while I pondered how I could bypass this, and I was eventually told that you can't be gifted a weapon below your MR requirements if the weapon is part of a bundle, and by sheer coincidence, coincidence, the Stug is in a bundle, but in the end, I do not know if this is true or not, as I decide to not skip this blockade. I decided that I would reach Mastery Rank 2, get the materials, and build the Stug myself. I soon came to realize just how big of a mistake this was. Rebecca tells me about a black market peddler who has gotten himself stuck in gay baby jail. I then depart to help them, determined to make sure that I am not the only gay baby who is free from jail. Vor tells me the exact same thing he told me during a previous mission, and fearing that daddy may have a form of dementia, I put the fears behind me and continue the mission. I locate the jail cell, free the captive, who looks oddly similar to the man who gave me that sweet neural sensor, and we leave. But not before Vor, in a show of his alpha male dominance over my stugless existence, forces me to eat my Paris bow. He then lowers my shield count, apparently unaware of the fact that having a low shield count is now a viable meta thanks to shield gating, the fool, and I leave for extraction. I equip my first mod onto Volt and then Rebecca directs me to a Minecraft colony, and I fly down to steal their iron ore. Upon acquiring it, Rebecca then directs me to do something that feels like a tug on my ball hairs. She demands that I kill 30 Grenier in revenge for their actions against Minecraft gamers everywhere. Clearly, she has not played The Last of Us Part 2. Everyone knows
knows that revenge will only lead to an endless cycle of revenge and also terrible story plots, bad character writing, and improper use of golf clubs. Begrudgingly, I fulfill her request by forcing them all to sniff my feet before leaving. I use my acquired iron ore to craft a workbench. Ortis expresses his frustrations at the game's monetization scheme, Darvo proposes the best idea that is somehow still not in the game, and I'm sent on yet another resource hunt. But before I depart, I use a redeemable code in the marketplace to gain access to a giant golden hand decoration for the ship. I can now be fisted every time I come back to my ship and be reminded of what a terrible idea this run was. Vor, upset that Mom won the divorce settlement, decides to ignore the court order and cut off my communications with her. After extracting, he goes on a five-minute tirade about how I'm now his bitch or something as I look through what few cosmetic options I have and I give my Volt the only acceptable makeover I can think of. Afterwards, I access the foundry, craft the anti-daddy collar key, and remove my restraint. Vor, clearly not aware of what I am doing, goes on yet another five-minute spiel about what a great pappy he is. He then realizes that I decided he was not the man that I imagined, and I request that we break up. Sadly, he doesn't seem to take it very well. Rebecca comes back and delivers the most emotional line ever heard in gaming. I thought... I thought I lost you. You can just taste the distress in her voice. Vor, being the clingy ass dom that he is, decides that if he can't have me, no one can, and has rigged my asshole to explode or something. Mom grants me permission to spank him, and I happily accept. I'm sent on another mission to acquire a navigation segment, and I'm shot down to a Grenier ship. I find the segment, as Rebecca gives me a choice that will forever rock my standing in karma within the game's factions. I can either leave now and let some e boys get explodinated, or I can attempt to to save them. I doubt that none of them have a stug to give me in return for saving them, so I leave them to their fate. And this is just one of many moral choices that Warframe presents you with. Truly. This is a game of hard, impactful decisions. I stick the nav segment into my almighty golden hand, apparently, and I am sent down to confront Vor. Vor does his usual Vor thing of not not speaking, I loot a number of chests, and eventually come to the big boy himself. Vor is not a difficult fight, but using only your feet sure makes it a tedious one. Vor has a total of three invincibility phases, but luckily, they do not last long at all. His piss beams also don't really do anything to me, nor do the minions around. Him. Eventually, he gets tired and has a lie down, and he finally agrees that we should see other people. I leave him to his slumber and return to the ship. With the tutorial done, it was now time to begin building up towards the Stug. It is at this point that I will now begin skipping over a lot of mission runs for the sake of making this a video that can actually be made without it being over 7 hours long, but I will go over these first few. My first mission was the Defense, which is probably the most annoying mission type to deal with by far. It may come as a surprise to you. But doing five waves of defense using nothing but your feet is not exactly a pleasant experience. At one point, I apparently got a killed registered, but I have absolutely no clue how it happened. Looking back at the footage, I believe my feet caused something to explode, and for some reason that explosion was counted as my damage when it blew the Screener's ass out of his mouth, but as to what exactly exploded, I have no fucking clue. I assume a grenade, but I didn't hear any beeping. I also didn't see an explosive barrel around anywhere, so your guess is as good as mine. Either way, it's not a problem. I just have to kill the game EXE to prevent it from registering the kill on my profile and redo the mission. Normally, Alt F4ing will cause the game to save the stats that you got on a mission before closing the game. But if you end the executable on Task Manager, it luckily doesn't do that. I use this a few times during the run whenever I make a mistake like this. I relog, make sure that the kill did indeed not register, and I redo the mission. I then head to Cetus. I encounter one of Warframe's many bugs, and then go talk to Konzu. Then, I enter the planes, and immediately leave afterwards so that the node is counted as complete. I have no intention of doing plane bounties for the time being, because I think I'd rather go back to being sad that I still don't have my stug. Speaking of, my focus was now on getting my mastery rank up, which is no easy task when you consider I can't use any weapon that isn't a stug, but I did have a method. After doing a few more missions, I gained access to a spy node on Earth. Spy missions grant a large large burst of affinity to all your weapons and your frame when hacking a terminal undetected. And this was 
by far the perfect option since I did not have to kill anyone to get the affinity. After a run or two, I was able to do the first mastery ring test, so I set off to the relay to first do a practice run. Mom demands that I use a primary weapon in this test, to which I tell her she's not the boss of me. I begin doing my usual footwork when once again a fucking explosion kills an enemy and registers it as my own. I won't tell the game how to handle its business, but I will tell it that it is utterly and completely wrong. Luckily, this was only a practice run, so I kill the game executable and try again. This time, I attempt the actual qualification, and I succeed. I am one step closer to achieving the strongest handgun ever made. I then set my eyes on a junction. Junctions reward mastery rank XP upon completion, and we need to get them out of the way anyways in order to unlock the other planets. So, I set off towards the Venus Junction. The Venus Junction Spectre is Rhino, who proves to be quite an annoying obstacle. His constant use of iron skin means that a good chunk of time is spent dwindling it down with my toes before I can do any actual damage. Even worse, when it's up, his shields recharge, so I need to get through those all over again every time he casts the power. It takes quite a good while, and he even gets close to killing me thanks to his slash procs, but eventually, I emerge the victor. I decide to be a toxic gamer, then I explode, some schmuck of a planet that was stupid enough to be in the way of my giant death beam. I heard later that the blame was pinned on some space emperor twink, who then got killed by a golden haired monkey or something, but it is not my problem. With the junction complete, gain access to Venus, and after a few more nodes, I also gain access to another spy mission. Notably, this one gives more XP than the last one, so I grind this one out for a good number of hours, slowly but surely making my way towards MR2. At some point, I remembered that I got access to the Taxon blueprints. Realizing that I would need some company for the rest of this hellish existence, I opted to craft him, and just have him as a little buddy, to keep me just that little bit saner. Speaking of sanity, I was beginning to lose it a bit. I decided that maybe I could be a bitch and get a special special epic gamer that I know of to simply gift me a stug. But this was before I decided to bite the bullet and grind one out on my own, but still, I must own up to my moments of weakness. Luckily, or unfortunately, depending how you look at it, he was broke and could not gift me my weapon. I decided that he was useless to me and unworthy of being my sugar daddy, so I carried on. At this point, most of my footage was me just throwing myself at spy vaults over and over grinding out XP, so I really don't have much to say for this other than I did get an Ivara piece as well as a hornet strike out of the deal. So hey, that was nice. A bit later, I decided to break the monotony by doing a few different nodes, including my first capture, and capture can't eat my fucking ass. You wouldn't think it, but trying to get this bitch down was a lot more painful than it might seem, especially when the fucker kept getting help from ancients that reduced my already pitiful bullet jump damage, as well as the shield ospreys that were floating around. I was about ready to circumcise myself with my teeth, and I'm already circumcised. Eventually, I did him, becoming thankful that the spy missions were at least easy in the process, and I continue my grind. Soon enough, I finally hit MR2. The only thing left to do now was do the MR2 test. At least, that was the plan, until DE slapped me in the face with this lovely timer. Apparently, you're not allowed to do multiple tests in one day. Makes absolutely no sense to me, but whatever. With this unavoidable roadblock, I retired for that day, and went to go take a shower and cry in the corner of the tub. The next day, it was time for the test. This one was much like the previous one. Mom wanted me to use my secondary, but she didn't seem to understand that I didn't have the one sidearm I was allowed to use. So once again, it was down to my pacifying feet to do the job. It went as smoothly as last time, and I was finally MR2. We then had another issue to focus on. While we did have most of the resources needed to craft the Stug, we were missing Gallium and Salvage. Now, Salvage wasn't too difficult of a problem. Gallium on the other hand, decided it wasn't going to allow this to be easy. Gallium can only be found consistently on Mars and Uranus. It's also in some other miscellaneous methods like Cetus bounties and a few oddball nodes, but consistently, it's only found on those planets. The closest one I have access to is Mars, which is behind the Mars junction on Earth. I can only do that junction by completing Suisi on Mercury. But in order to get to Mercury, I need to carve my way through Venus and do the Mercury Junction. The Mercury Junction, amongst other requirements, wants me to defeat the Jackal, as well as do 10 waves of defense at a node in a single mission. And I also need to complete the Once Awake quest, why not? At this point, I wanted the sweet embrace of death like never before. In hindsight, I probably should have farmed Cetus bounties for the Gallium, but I had no idea what the drop rate for it was at the time and didn't feel like checking, so I 
opted for the hard way. So, I set out on this new goal of mine, and the first thing we needed to do was to get to the Mercury Junction on Venus, which means more nodes. My excitement was palpable. This is also my first taste of mobile defense, and at this point, it became abundantly clear that I was so unbelievably used to things like Energize and Zenuric, because after just one or two Volt Shields, I was already unable to put down any more. Being completely reliant on energy orbs feels terrible. And this goes beyond just the stug run, it feels terrible in general. And it makes me think that there maybe needs to be an early game method of gaining energy at a more bearable rate. Anyways, it soon became obvious that in order to defend these terminals, I needed to distract the enemies with my succulent body. Though Volt was a little worse for wear by the end of it. I then set my eyes on the Jackal. This boss had recently been reworked, and unfortunately for this specific run, it was for the worst. In order to land the final blow on the Jackal, you need to use your Parazon. And after testing it on my main account, I learned that yes, this kill does indeed add to the kill stat on your profile. I could have just labeled this as semantics and decided that it didn't count, but I thought about how unsatisfying it would be if by the end of the run, I had kills dedicated solely to the Jackal that weren't on my Stug. So instead, I invoked Rule 4 of the run. I stated that I would only be using teams when absolutely necessary to maintain the run, and this was one of those times. I would fight the Jackal, and I used the word fight with heavy quotation marks, with a team, and allow one of my teammates to deal the final blow, thus keeping my stat page clean. While waiting for people to join, I found someone who forgot their safe word, left them to their punishment, and restarted the mission after realizing that no one wanted to play with me. During my next attempt, I encountered a rhino. We, and by we I mean he, stepped forth to defeat Mr. Jackal Coon. And not much happened during this fight, though I did eat a face full of bad laser and died. But at the last health state for the Jackal, we hit a host migration. I was once again left alone with a nearly killed Jackal, yet no way to finish it off. For one reason or another, DE simply does not want me using their game as a CBT simulator. Personally, I can't imagine why. I expressed my sorrow by throwing myself into the electric boogaloo shower, quitting the mission, and trying again. This time, getting a full group. Me and another Volt ate shit and watched our teammate value face-fucking the Jackal over healing us. Then, deciding that actually trying to do the fight as intended was for losers, I instead hung from a wall and watched as my teammates got Bill Fried by the science guys. But eventually, me and the boys came out on top. Afterwards, I decided to get the 10 wave defense out of the way. I have nothing to say about it. It was boring. It was frustrating. It made me incredibly flaccid. Then, after a quick rescue, it was finally time to attempt the Mercury Junction. This junction fight was against a vault. Unfortunately for him, he had not seen the tortures that my vault had gone through and was thusly not prepared for the literal face stomping he was going to get. The specter went down in a breeze and another junction was activated. I then decided to tackle the once await quest. Mom informs me of some bioweapon malarkey that the Grenier are experimenting with, so she sticks me on them to teach the boys a lesson. Turns out, it's the infested. I stomp on a few of their faces while Reb tells me about how bad the Orkin were, and soon enough, that's the first part down. Reb then rewarded me with a mod that I will never be using because it is a melee mod, and apparently I am not allowed to light the stug on fire and use it as a club, even though it would be a hundred times better if used that way. I do a defense part of the quest, succeed, and am given a flame stick that, once again, I will not be using because it is in fact not a stug. And the once await quest is complete. The last thing needed before I can access Mars is to complete the suicide node on Mercury. Ortis reminds me of the most important slider in the option menu. I do the string of nodes leading up to Suisi, and before long, I have fulfilled all of the junction requirements. And this junction fight was with Frost, who was by far the hardest one so far. His hammer hurts like hell, and he has a nasty habit of using avalanche to freeze you in place and then shattering you into a million pieces. His AI also acted relatively smart as well. It retreated a number of times, making me chase him, and this often caused his shields to recharge. It also led me to more cluttered parts of the map, making it harder to get bullet jumps in while also avoiding his inevitable hammer swings. He actually felt like an actual boss. His hammer was telegraphed enough to where you could time bullet jumps in between his mistimed swings. Combined with the Spectre having a cooldown on its abilities, keeping a mental note of when he'd be able to use Avalanche again, and using the momentum from a bullet jump aim glide to escape hammers if I do get frozen, became the staple strategies to get Blue Balls McGee down. I also used my Skana in order to block a number of hammer 
strikes, as you can still block if you're frozen. Given that I never attacked, let alone killed Frost with the weapon, I'm considering it fair game for the challenge. It did, however, get me killed once where Frost seemingly broke my guard and then splattered my face on the concrete. Eventually, after five or so deaths, I killed him and took his junction as tribute. With all the requirements done, I finally had access to Mars. I did a few node runs there, got the remaining resources I needed, and I was finally able to craft the Stug. So I started its construction in the foundry and called it a day. The next time I logged in, I was greeted with a Rhino Systems. This was incredibly lucky as he was today's focus. But first, we needed to go to the Foundry. And there, glistening in all of its glory, was our weapon of choice. We were finally armed, and dare I say, almost dangerous. Our next task, as mentioned before, was to acquire Rhino. Rhino has access to both Iron Skin as well as Roar, two powers that are valid in this run, so he is probably one of our best allies to pick up. So we once again head off to the Jackal. I rode around in the invisible boat mobile, tripped into a wall, was not surprised to see that even D cares so little about this weapon that it still has self damage on it, and eventually I acquired all of Rhino's parts. It was then time for the Arcwing quest. I defended some consoles, once again questioned why D made the Stug's existence such a torturous one, and got explodinated on my journey to get my wings. It was also around this point that I learned of yet another crucial flaw with this weapon. It is incapable of dealing damage to glassmaker enemies. Even if you land a shot perfectly on their weak zones, it does nothing. But do you know what works? <laughs> That's right! Your toes are once again more useful than a tool that was actually intended to do damage. Afterwards, I got a potato with my first Nightwave credits, threw it on the Stug, modded it and Vault out a bit, and claimed my Arcwing from the Foundry. After giving my ship a proper makeover and setting Rhino up to be built, I then decided to spend my starter Platinum. There were a number of valuable things I could have gotten with it as well. An Orc and Reactor. Hell, I could even get two of them. Or I could get some extra Warframe slots. Ultimately, though, I determined that the best choice was to get a flowy ribbon on my back. Was this a bad use of my extremely limited platinum for the entire run? Yes. Do I regret it? It was then time to complete the Arcwing quest line. Or at least it was, had I not run into another uh-oh. This last part of the quest requires you to be in Arcwing and go through a short run of the controls. But near the end, there is a scripted Zeflin spawn. A Zeflin is a device that locks you into a giant bubble until it is destroyed. The Stug is not available for use within Arcwing. There is also no way to destroy the Zeflin without registering it as a kill as far as I know. I tried multiple times to bypass the trigger. I tried dying, ramming my face into it, but nothing worked. I was going to need some assistance. And using the power of heterosexual life mate friendships, I was able to get carried through the mission as my beautiful boy handled the Zeppelins for me. By the by, he also wanted me to inform you all that I interrupted his masturbatory afterglow when I requested his help. Afterwards, we parted ways, and the Arcwing quest line was complete. I finished up a few more wing nodes, smashed my head into some asteroids, then attempted to fight Vanguard. Heck. Key word being attempt. Turns out, you can't actually fight him until MR5. I honestly had no idea this was a thing, and it made me very sad. So instead, I went to go do my first interception with the Stug. And you know what's fun about interception with the Stug? Shooting someone and then having to wait seven years before the jizz ball explodes. All the while your target hacks a control point. If I had a nickel for every time a Stug shot didn't explode in time before an enemy capped a point, I'd have like eight nickels. After this run, I turned in for the night and took a few days break from the run. When I came back, I claimed Rhino from the Foundry, gave him the usual makeover, proceeded to claim domination over more nodes, and eventually we arrived at the boss of Mars, Lech Krill. And Lech Krill decided that this was going to take a while. He was yet again another obstacle that wasn't necessarily a threat to me, but sure did like rubbing in the fact that my weapon was about as deadly as a reasonably sharpened candy cane. Luckily, when he went flame mode, on me, he dropped much quicker, and Lech was down for the count. Soon after, I found myself taking on my first disruption, and I came to know the fear of seeing this absolute unit charging at me when my only weapon is a water balloon catapult. After saving three conduits, I get absolutely fucking decked by this guy, while my other man's done did blow up. But three out of four conduits was enough for the mission, so I left and continued on to my next node. After that, I encountered a faulty laser defense system at one point, because 
I passed right through the grid and took their MacGuffin with no trouble, got some friends to carry me through more Arcwing Hell, gave Sabuchi a mod he somehow did not have yet, got 10 Platinum and a Kappa in return, and went to go clear some Phobos and Ceres junction requirements in order to finish up Mars. Along the way, I met Stalker for the first time. I then ungabunged his face in with my mightier seed, was toxic towards him, and afterwards it was time for another junction. This time, against Mag. Unfortunately for her, she would be the first Spectre to face my newly armed Wrath. While she did try to get me to snug myself with the reverse Uno card that is Magnetized Bubble a few times, the joke was on her. Because apparently the Stug doesn't need magnetism in order to hurt its wielder. Learning this, she gave up all hope and fell to my mighty snowballs. Then, it was time to complete another quest. This time, Stolen Dreams. Rebecca informs us that the Grenier were incompetent, big surprise, and lost some magical MacGuffin to Maroon 5 or something. I'm sent out to question her, but end up just being toxic again before absorbing her into my hand. It's really do be like that, sometimes. After that, I'm sent to get said magical MacGuffins from a number of Spy Vault missions. I do them flawlessly, as per usual. Smooth one, tin suit. And we continue on. After the vaults, Maru then sends me to the machine that will allow me to exchange my good boy points for profit. So I do so, though in the process, I get catfished, because it turns out the treasure is actually getting to listen to someone on their Xbox 360 headset, then getting attacked by walking jellyfish. I go splurt splurt on it, escape from the derelict, extract to complete the quest, and I think I'll call this the end for part one of the run. My original plan was to have this entire run all on one video. It, uh, quickly became apparent at just how foolish I was to think that. Warframe is a pretty large game if you're new to it. It's easy to complain about a content drought or whatever when you've been playing for five to seven years, but it soon became apparent just how much shite I would have to get through in order to complete this fucking challenge. So, uh, yeah, this is gonna be a multi-part series. With that said, I'll see you all sometime in the future. Because, you know, I can't think of anything I'd love to do more than to spend more time with this abomination of a weapon! <gasps> Buh bye now.